Starbo Mustard. The English Mustard. Thank George, it's Coleman's. Who else can match the enormous selection of quality used cars at CG Ford across Cumbria? Call in and take a look. This Wednesday, there's 20% off for the over 60s at Texas. Double discount. Just bring proof of age for 20% off everything. Wednesday at Texas. Nice to see you again. Oh, yes. Hasn't time flown? Yes, it stood still for you. I have grey hair. You're not grey at all, are you? That's because I look after myself. I discovered just for men. Simply apply, wait five minutes and rinse off. Grey hairs just disappear. With just for men, no grey, just natural looking colour. Your husband is so young looking. Are you sure he and my Harry went to school together? Just for men gets rid of the grey in just five minutes. Notorious A1 prompt renewed calls for improved safety. Top class runners find their way through the forests of southern Scotland, and the 50 famous faces of Hoyk are unveiled to the townsfolk. Good evening. A fatal crash on the A1 south of Berwick has today brought renewed calls for the notorious road to be upgraded to dual carriageway standard. Two men were killed and three people injured, one seriously in the collision. It's thought all the victims were from out of the area. The accident happened on the Belford Bypass stretch of the A1 at around 5.30 this morning. The road was partially blocked until shortly after 8. The accident happened on this single carriageway stretch of road about 10 miles south of Berwick. It was reported by an off-duty police officer passing the scene on his way to work. Both cars were so badly wrecked that the fire brigade were required to cut some of the occupants free. Well, I, I was called out about shortly after six o'clock this morning and my arrival at the scene, uh, there were two vehicles involved. And it was obviously from the damage from the accident, um, from the damage to the vehicles, that uh, there'd been almost a, a head-on collision. It was virtually offside to offside with considerable impact damage to both vehicles. Well, unfortunately, both drivers were killed. Um, we believe pretty well instantaneously. Um, we have three passengers from one of the vehicles presently at Ashington Hospital undergoing treatment. Uh, we'd like to hear from anybody who actually witnessed the accident or perhaps around about 5.30 this morning saw a brown coloured uh, Vauxhall Chevette travelling north on the A1 in that vicinity or conversely if anyone saw a light coloured Ford Fiesta travelling south on the A1 on the Belford Bypass, uh, even just immediately before the accident, ideally would like to speak to them. The A1 stretches 115 miles between Newcastle and Edinburgh. 80 of those miles are single carriageway. Drivers frustrated by slow moving lorries or holiday traffic often take risks and the results can be tragic. Members of Northumbria County Council have campaigned for three years to upgrade the northern stretch of the A1 to dual carriageway. Devastated again by another accident on the A1 itself. We, in fact, have an accident rate, an average, of over 12 fatalities a year. 12 fatalities a year is far too many. It's a carnage. And we've got to try to do something to put things right. People do argue that it's not the road that causes the problems, it's the drivers. What do you say to that? I would disagree with that entirely. I think it's the road which is creating the accidents, the road which is creating the fatalities. When in fact you have 80 odd miles of single carriageway, with a volume of traffic that's using it, that in fact tends to lead to tragedy. Ray Gilchrist's views have cross-party support and are backed by the motoring organisations. They feel that the A1 should definitely be upgraded to dual carriageway standard. At the moment it's a single carriageway, it's one of only two all-weather routes into Scotland and it has quite a number of small side roads joining the Joining the A1, you quite often get a driver who's stuck behind a tractor, a slow moving vehicle. If it was a dual carriageway, 
he could overtake with more safety. The Roads and Traffic Ministry say that with the volume of traffic averaging just 5,000 vehicles a day between Annick and Berwick, the northern part of the A1 doesn't justify expansion. But campaigners point out that many drivers avoid the A1 simply because of the hold-ups, and the figures don't take into account the volume of holiday traffic during the summer months. Ray Gilchrist pledges that the campaign for upgrading will continue. Fortunately, we have a, an excellent relationship with the borders and the regions and the districts in Scotland. And with concerted efforts over this last two years, through the, through the A1 main safe link committee, we've been campaigning rigorously to be heard in Westminster. The Roads Ministry has pledged £65 million to be spent on various A1 improvement schemes. It will cost a lot more than that to fully upgrade the whole of the A1. And for the moment, it seems no more money is forthcoming. A 23-year-old soldier died when his motorcycle collided with a lorry and a car near Dumfries. The crash on the A75 at Carruthers Town happened last night. The Amaha bike, belonging to Lance Corporal Colin Monteith from Lincolnshire, collided with two vehicles at the junction with the B725 road. No one else was injured. A six-year-old boy was kept in hospital overnight following a two-car crash on the A595 in Cumbria. The accident happened at the junction with the A66 near Cockermouth. Both car drivers were released from hospital after treatment. A £6 million equestrian centre is to be built near Ramsey on the Isle of Man. The complex will have, will ha will have one of the few international standard dressage arenas in Britain. The project, which, we, which will be built on farmland, will also have two outdoor arenas. The aim is to offer equestrian courses to riders and horses from all over the world. It's claimed that 10% of the Manx population support the campaign to save the 105-year-old Queen's Pier at Ramsey. Town commissioners say that more than 9,000 have signed a petition demanding that renovation work is carried out. Commissioner Bill Irving says the petition is more than double what they'd hoped for. It'll now be presented to Ports Minister Arnold Callan, whose department owns the pier. It's estimated that if the structure is saved, it'll cost £2 million to repair it. The government minister responsible for forests has been visiting Cumbria today. Baroness Trumpington was guest of honour at an open day at Grisdale Forest. Grisdale is open to the public all year round and the Baroness used the occasion to emphasise the government's commitment to encouraging free access to forest land. Torrential rain greeted the Baroness on her first visit to Grisdale Forest, so it was inside and under canvas for the opening speeches. It gives me great pleasure to declare open this Grisdale Forest Day. Thank you very much. The aim of the open day was to attract visitors to the forest and to give people the opportunity to question Forestry Commission staff about the work they do. For Baroness Trumpington, it was also an opportunity to answer her critics. Labour has accused the government of failing in its duty because, they say, when the Forestry Commission sells land to private buyers, there are no guarantees that public access will be maintained. We encourage access, of course we do, uh, but the, um, we are issuing a, a document uh, to local authorities asking them whether they, in, if we want to sell um, it's only a very small part of the whole estate. Um, if we're going to sell something in a particular local authority's area, uh, then that local authority can take on the responsibility for access, which is binding for future owners in perpetuity. After the introductions, it was out into the rain for the Baroness for a trip along a specially created forest trail. Here she witnessed the ancient skill of forgering, turning green wood on a traditional lathe. Forestry Commission staff worked in relentless rain as the Baroness looked on. This was a day for the Forestry Commission to show itself off, despite the weather. We are disappointed with the weather, but it's Cumbria, it's the Lake District, and it rains. We actually find that on a wet day, people can't get on the fells, and a lot of people come to the forest. So sometimes we're very busy on a wet day. The Forestry Commission's forests are, are the people's forests. They belong to the state. We want people to come and enjoy themselves. There are marvellous opportunities here, even on a wet day. But today was also a day for serious debate. Labour has criticised the government for not publicising who buys Forestry Commission land when it's sold but the criticism was swiftly quashed. It's, it's rather a silly one, if I may say so. What started off um, was 
that I mean, in if you're going to sell your house, uh, you're not going to actually publish your name and what you received for it. Uh, or if you were buying a house, I don't know that you'd be crazy to have uh, everybody know exactly what you paid for your new house. What we do uh, originally, it was considered a, a, a contract between two parties, with people being worried about the Forestry Commission being a public body. Uh, we now uh, ask the new owner whether we can publish his name and uh, what he paid, and it's up to the new owner really, and I think that's fair enough, don't you? Today's open day was the first such official event in Grisdale, but Forestry Commission staff are anxious to stress that it is open to the public all year round. Carlisle Police are trying to find the owners of valuable pieces of china. The cups and saucers include a quantity of mice and ware, and some were produced up to 80 years ago. Detectives believe the china was stolen before the 1st of August this year. Police would like to speak to anyone who recognises the find. They believe the china is worth hundreds of pounds. The final hurdle has been cleared for the building of a four and a half million pound leisure centre next to the Queen of the South football ground in Dumfries. The project will include two halls with ice hockey and bowling facilities, as well as changing rooms and a cafeteria. The scheme went before Nisdale planners today. Residents of Onken on the Isle of Man appear to have won a battle against plans for a major housing development on land overlooking Douglas Bay. Mainland developers have been refused permission to build 130 apartments in three seven-storey blocks. The site would have been that of the former Majestic Hotel on Onken Head. The 99-year-old hotel closed four years ago. Any appeal against the refusal of permission must be lodged by today, but the architects of the scheme say that so far they've had no instructions to do so. Plans have been unveiled for a new car park at Buttermere Village in the Lake District, where villagers earlier this year protested at the introduction of double yellow lines. The National Trust has applied to Allerdale Council for planning permission for the 30-vehicle car park at Crag Farm. Lake District planners have agreed that disabled orange badge holders should park free on planning board pay and display car parks in the National Park. The Visitor Services Committee also agreed to try out a pilot scheme for National Park residents that would give them a concessionary rate on the car parks. But they rejected a recommendation that locals should be given a £5 season ticket. They thought £20 was more appropriate. A new development plan for the former bus station site in Ambleside has gone on display. The exhibition, featuring a model of how the new shopping and housing scheme would look, is on show in the town library. Lake District planners want to hear what local people think about the proposal from developers Dimple Estates. Scotland's industry minister Alan Stewart has been accused of shirking his responsibilities over the textiles industry in the borders. The allegation has been made by local MPs Sir David Steele and Archie Kirkwood. They've been trying for some time to persuade the Scottish office to review the position of the knitwear industry in the light of recent redundancies and mill closures. The MPs are now calling for a meeting with the Minister to discuss the current crisis. It's been far from easy for the local textiles industry lately. In recent months, large numbers of knitwear workers have been made redundant and some mills have announced they're to close because they can no longer cope with the effects of the current recession. Borders MPs Sir David Steele and Archie Kirkwood say they've tried to stimulate greater government interest in the industry's plight, but without too much success. Mr Kirkwood had been pressing the Scottish office to review the local knitwear sector with the possibility of offering more government assistance. But he says the Scottish industry minister, Alan Stewart, has rejected that idea. On a recent visit to the borders, Mr Stewart saw for himself the difficulties experienced by local manufacturers. While touring Peter Scott Knitwear in Hoyk, which had to pay off more than 20 employees, the minister was told of the industry's fight to compete with cheap foreign knitwear. Replying to Archie Kirkwood's concern, the minister said, I acknowledge that much of the textiles industry is experiencing difficult trading conditions at present. However, business should improve as the economy recovers. And Mr Stewart pointed out that Scottish Borders Enterprise was committed to helping out local industry. However, Mr Kirkwood said, the response I got from Alan Stewart added up to nothing more than a restatement of what Scottish Enterprise and the Borders Local Enterprise Company had decided to do already. And that, he said, was an abdication of ministerial responsibility. 
One of the Isle of Man's best-known pubs has been saved from closure for the second time in three years. The Castle Arms at Castletown, better known as the Glue Pot, is to be bought by a multi-millionaire Irish businessman living on the island. Stuart Jameson plans to spend £100,000 on renovating the premises to keep it more in line with the medieval theme of nearby Castle Russian, one of the island's leading tourist attractions. A former bobbin mill which has been transformed into a heritage and visitor centre at Gatehouse of Fleet will be officially open next month. The mill opens for visitors in 10 days' time, but Magnus Magnusson will carry out the official opening ceremony. The premises will show a history of the area and also the rise and fall of the cotton industry. An 84-year-old woman is this year's winner of Whitehaven Civic Society's Best Kept Backyard Competition. Florence Watson has developed the back of her home in Glen Ridding Walk over a period of about 20 years. Her colourful display of a wide variety of flowers has earned her the shield, which will be presented next month. Football and Carlisle United take on Scottish Premier League side St Johnson tonight in a pre-season friendly at Brunton Park. The Cumbrians have injury problems though. John Deacon, Paul Proudlock and Michael Bennett are all under treatment. Several of the club's YTS trainees are also injured. Meanwhile, Queen of the South conclude their pre-season campaign tonight with a home match against First Division Hamilton. Queens are unlikely to risk keeper Alan Davidson, who has a leg injury, with the new season just four days away. And still with sport, the biggest orienteering festival in Great Britain is being held in the forest throughout the south of Scotland this week. The six-day competition, which is held every two years, has attracted well over 3,000 entries from more than 20 countries. Today, the action took place at Bowhill House near Selkirk, where the weather made the running far from easy. There were going to be no record-breaking times at Bowhill today as the heavens opened on the 3,000-strong field as they braved appalling conditions to complete day three of the week-long Scottish Orienteering Festival. Competitors from 20 countries running in categories ranging from the under-10s to the over-75s trekked round a series of courses in woodland surrounding Bowhill House. For the organisers, years of planning has relied on the support of landowners throughout the south of Scotland. They've been surprisingly cooperative. We've had a lot of help from the Forestry Commission as usual, but private landowners too, as uh, today where we're on the Buclu estate lands, have been very helpful. Uh, I think the past record of orienteers in leaving the sites that they use uh, free of uh, litter and taking responsibility for any possible damage that might be done, like uh, a nod stone being knocked out of a dry stone dike, has given us quite a good reputation. You have hundreds of foreign athletes here. How have they been adapting, not only to the competition, but also to the weather? I think very well. In fact, the uh, home of uh, orienteering is the Scandinavian area. So the athletes from Norway, Finland and Sweden are very accustomed to running in wet weather. It was very easy, just running. Before it was more difficult yesterday. Why was it more difficult yesterday? Uh, it was more tracks today. I think it's tracks. I haven't missed a lot. Um, three or four minutes. It's very easy, I think. It's. Do you enjoy the rain? Yes, it's good and running in rain. It's not so hot. But not everyone found the going so easy. The medical team has had to deal with over 40 casualties daily, suffering a variety of injuries. A lot of minor cuts, grazes, people just falling about on bits of loose wood in the forest. Nothing very major so far, I'm glad to say. It's a six-day competition. Does the time and distance eventually take its toll on the athletes? Yes, it does. I think the rest day tomorrow is going to be, uh, is, is obviously a good thing. Um, but by the end of the week, I can imagine that a lot of these minor sprains are going to be feeling pretty uncomfortable. The south of Scotland and Cumbria is well represented in the festival, with the border liners and Solway orienteers among the clubs involved. I hope I did well today. It's, uh, uh, the forest was very fast. Uh, good running today, a nice mixture, combination of moorland and, and technical forest. It was a, a, good, a good run, nice courses. How have the foreign competitors adapted to the conditions then? I think most of them adapt quite well. The Scandinavians must be used to the rain as well. It, it, it's perhaps some of the other nations will find it hard today because our forests are very rough and when they're wet they become very slippery as well. But uh, apart from that, probably quite well. Hoping for a good position today? I hope so, yes. I've had quite a good run. Um, probably finished second or third, something like that. So, quite pleased. 
Although there is a competitive edge to the festival, the event is a chance for orienteers to get together and participate in a sport they obviously enjoy, whatever the weather. A teenager is recovering in hospital after falling from a farm roof at Jebra. 18-year-old Grant Douglas from Kelso was climbing a ladder which slipped from beneath him and he fell 10 feet to the ground. He was working as a slater at Dolphinston Farm. He was taken to the Borders General Hospital suffering from concussion and shock. Traders and Gallish Hills are being asked for their views amid fears that changes in the town centre could sound the death knell for local shops. Borders Regional Council is planning to exclude vehicles from the town centre in the latest phase of their traffic management scheme, but businessmen fear that customers may drive elsewhere. Now the council is writing to shop owners in Channel Street and Overhawk Street to seek their views. The Northumbria Police Authority is warning that the force may have to axe up to 300 jobs next year unless it gets more financial help from the Home Office. Authority Chairman Councillor George Gill says the force has already lost more than 100 jobs this year in a cost-saving exercise and claims the situation is increasingly grave at a time of record crime levels. A delegation from the authority will meet with Home Office officials later this week. Detectives in Berwick are investigating a break-in at a town centre nightclub. Thieves escape with £6,500 from bedrocks in Golden Square. Police say the thieves removed the back of a safe to get the money. Tourism in the borders has fallen as a result of overseas visitors staying at home this summer. Riddle Graham, the director of the Scottish Borders Tourist Board, said the statistics had shown a drop of 15% in the number of foreign tourists visiting the board's information centre. Melrose could have its first indoor market next year. Plans have been lodged with Borders Regional Council for a market in a former furniture warehouse just off Buclue Street. The man behind the development is Melrose businessman Jimmy Clinkscale. Seven units are included in the plan and opening times have yet to be discussed. People in the Peebles area would like to see the present two-tier system of local government replaced by single authorities. A survey run by the local community council revealed a clear majority of 85 to 43 people in favour of single councils running local affairs. The questionnaire also showed a majority of people in favour of the current first-past-the-post electoral system. Galashiels Burns Club is to host the Burns Federation International Conference in 1995. Over 600 delegates are expected to attend the conference, which will be held over four days in September. An international folk week is to be staged in the borders next month. The five-day programme is being organised by the Regional Council's Project Europe initiative. Events will take place in several border towns. Among the artists taking part will be a dance group from Lithuania. As well as public performances, professional musicians and dancers will provide daily workshops. Hoik and Jedbra are among the prize winners in this year's beautiful Scotland in Bloom competition. The two towns are the only Borders winners from a record entry of 288 towns and villages across the country. The result has been greeted with delight by Roxburgh Council Park Superintendent John Ingalls. He paid tribute to local businessmen for their support. Some of the region's most beautiful flowers there. Now, 50 of the best-known faces in Hoyk have been immortalised in black and white at a special exhibition in the town. Until today, the identities of the famous 50 had been a closely guarded secret, with local photographer Derek Lunn making all his subjects take an oath not to tell anyone. Despite a leak, he's confident many of his subjects will not only be surprised, but also amused by the end result. The past 18 months have been hard work for Hoik-born photographer Derek Lunn, and that was before he'd taken any of the 50 portraits on display at Hoik Museum in Wilton Lodge Park. Most of the blood, sweat and tears was spent deciding just who to leave out of the famous 50. Hoik is full of characters. Um, always has been. Uh, there's always been a great uh, worthy tradition, as they call it here. I wouldn't like to say they, these ones are worthy, these are better not. But uh, there's still many characters in Hoik, and I've tried to bring out all the characters I could. As you say, some of them, not because of the job, they're just natural born characters. and. Everybody agreed quite happily to do it, so I really quite enjoyed doing it. It's a great range of varying personalities. People change totally when you put them in front of a camera. And some people are great and absolutely no problem. Other people you had to sit with for a long time to get them to relax and talk to them. But uh, everybody was, in the end, very willing. 
uh, which helped quite a lot. Pubs, local opera, rugby, the common riding and simply wheel kent faces make up the core of the exhibition, titled Honest Men and Bright-Eyed Daughters. Among the 40 men and 10 women selected by Derek is singer Bobby Fish of the rock and roll outfit Johnny and the Rockos, who like all the others had not seen the end result. I recognise the shades in there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, looking quite pensive there, Derek. Uh, I think I must have just had a letter from the Inland Revenue there. Bobby can interrupt. How do you think you look? Pensive. <laughs> pensive. Very thoughtful. Uh, I, was, I must have been taking this quite seriously. You know. How do you feel to be one of Hoyt's 50th best Kent faces? I was quite amused, but very, very proud. Um, I think it's. Uh, I think it's a great honour to be involved in it. You know, I mean, I was born and bred in Hoyt, and um, I'm very proud of the town. Another shock participant was Borders Regional Councillor John Ross Scott. Yes, I like the tea cup. <laughs> tea pot, right? Thank you, boy. Thank you. Well, Jar, have you recovered? What do you think of it? <laughs> it's it's good. Well, I have to say it's good, don't I? I have to say it's good. Yeah, it's excellent. I think I'll have a lot of time to look at it and all the others, but uh, I think he's got me. He's got me definitely. Is your office normally that untidy then? Yes, my attic. This is my attic. These are the cobwebs, uh, but I think it uh, it tells the other side of GR, doesn't it? Uh, rather than the, uh, the serious council side. Coupled with amusing biographies written by local historian Ian Landles, the exhibition which runs until September the 1st is certain to create a lot of interest. And if you think anyone who deserved a place is missing, they may well appear in Derek's next 50 faces. He's had plenty of suggestions. And now the main stories of the day again. A fatal... The display features photographs of 50 of Hoyk's best-known characters. In its first week alone, it attracted over 2,600 visitors. Entitled Honest Men and Bright-Eyed Daughters, the exhibition continues until the end of the month. Well, it was the start of the Scottish football...